Good morning. It's good to see you out here this morning on this snowy, cold November day. Glad that you made it out. Um, I had announced actually something on Facebook that I was going to preach on today. If you're here to hear that sermon, I'm sorry. You'll have to come back next week. Um, after I realized, I looked around in Bible class and I saw there's like 20 people here. A few of you have decided to show up at 1030, but uh, in Bible class there wasn't any people here, so I decided I'm going to switch. I'm going to go to plan B um, and preach this next week. It was about marriage anyway, so I thought maybe next week some of our young folks who are visiting back home from college might be here anyway. So it might be good for them to hear that next Sunday morning. So plan on it then. I apologize if I busted your bubble here today. Um, but I am going to cover it next week, so that's just, I guess I pulled the bait and switch on you. Uh, you have to come back next week. There are times in Scripture where God uses the less is more concept of getting the work done. In the days of Gideon, which we studied about in Bible class this morning, I was thinking about that as we took a look at the character of Gideon in Judges chapter 6 and 7. God trims the army of Gideon down from 32,000 people to start with, down to 300 people to get the job done against the Midianites. Uh, and the point, I mean the real basic point that we're supposed to learn from that is that God can use a small group to do great things. And as I looked around in Bible study uh, and saw the faithful few gathered here this morning, I thought of how Gideon should really be an inspiration to us. That should be one of the big lessons that we take home from that Bible study, that God can use a small amount of resources to do great things. And so today I thought it might be good for us to think about that as a church and to think about uh, if you will think about it with me, the benefits of a small church. The definition of church sizes is kind of arbitrary when people are polling churches and trying to define what a small or a medium or a large church is. It, it varies from person to person. Uh, obviously, churches come in all sorts of sizes. There are some that are pretty large we hear of mega churches. That's kind of the label that we ascribe to those churches that number in the thousands, even the tens of thousands. And some churches are small with as few as two or more people meeting in a home somewhere. Some people define churches as a small church as a church that's less than 200 members. And as you look around the United States, 80% of churches in the U.S. are considered small churches. Take a look around Kokomo. And just count up the number of churches that probably have 200 or less members. I would say that's the majority of churches in the city of Kokomo, broadly speaking. A medium church is defined as having 201 to 400 members. That's 10% of churches. 10% of churches are medium churches. And then a large church is 400 members or more. That's 10% as well of uh, churches in the U.S. Uh, but for some, even 200 members might constitute a large church. Um, when I was preaching over in Ohio, uh, a lot of the churches over there are, you know, 50 people is a big church. When I tell them I preach at a church for 100 people, they're like, wow, that's a lot of people. Well, in my experience, it's, it's kind of average. I've been to churches that are bigger and churches that are smaller, but um, it's all relative, I guess, is the point. But there are benefits of small churches that are often lost in larger churches. And I want to think about that with you because I think every once in a while we need to point out the benefits of being a part of a smaller group and um, use that as we talk to other people as well. Now, my purpose in this lesson, it's not to encourage stagnation in church growth, that we be content with being small. So don't get that idea. Uh, it's to remind us of the benefits and the obligations of a small church, lest we become discouraged. Um, so consider a few things with me. Some of the benefits of a small church. One, 
of the benefits is that there's a, a stronger sense of family, if you will. It's easier to know everybody. Um, in 3 John, in verse 14, when you read the words of John in that third little short letter there, he says, I hope to see you shortly. We shall speak face to face. Peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. I think he's writing to probably a smaller group here, a group who knew each other's names. And that may have been a very well a benefit that you know each other's names. Uh, I know people who go to some churches and they don't know hardly anybody at the church. I would say that's kind of a disadvantage. There's not a, a, a sense of community, uh, a sense of family. Um, and for some people, that's why they want to go to big churches, because they don't want to have a sense of family. They don't want people knowing what's going on in their lives. They want kind of to, to live a private life and just come and sit through the worship service for an hour, and that's it. But I'd say it's an advantage. That we, there's a sense of family in the church, because the church is supposed to be a family. The church is called the household of God. Household means family. The church is a family, so we should want to have a family type of atmosphere. Um, face to face interaction is much easier in a smaller group and even when we don't remember people's names you might remember their face um, a small church is a, a church where it's easier to develop familial relationships and so I, I think that's a positive thing that a sense of family is proper um, I think about my kids sometimes when I think about this particular point and I'm glad that my kids have developed friendships not just with people their age, but they've developed friendships with older people. They've got a few extra grandmas here. Um, when you go to their soccer games or uh, their basketball games, or whatever it is they're playing, that encourages them. And I'm glad that we have close enough relationships with people that there are people who actually come and support them in that outside of the church building. I would say generally they're the only uh, people I'm on a team whose fellow church members actually come out and support them in those ways. And they feel like they feel like they're family. They come up and give you hugs after the games and get hugs and get support. And that's a positive thing. That my kids have developed friendships with older folks. I had Joe read Titus 2, and I'm sorry, Joe, about you. Um, so thank you for calling me out. I appreciate that. <laughs> but <laughs> in Titus chapter 2. Joe read to us about how older women are supposed to be teachers of good things and admonishing younger women, and that older men are to be teaching the younger men certain things as well, to be sober-minded and set a good example and, and be a good example in their speech. Well, you, you don't do those things if you don't develop those relationships. And so you should be developing relationships, older people with younger people, younger people with older people. And in smaller groups, sometimes you have that opportunity to cross generational lines. You've been to some churches maybe where there's a, there's a whole row full, and there's advantages to that as well. You've got a whole row full of people your age, uh, but sometimes there could be the tendency to be cliquish, where we only speak to people who are our age. Um, and we don't develop relationships with older people. And we ought not to be cliquish. We ought to be developing relationships with old and young in all of the family of God. First Timothy chapter 5, you'll notice that Paul, when he writes to Timothy, he talks about how Timothy should be treating people in different age brackets. And you'll notice that he used to be treating them the way that he would treat his own family. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 1, he says, Don't rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father. Which means that Timothy must have had relationships with older men, but here's how you treat them. Treat them like you would your father. Be careful with your tongue and how you speak to an older man. He says, treat younger men as brothers. I can be a little bit more upfront with younger men and with people who are my companions, like I am with my own brothers. He says, treat older women as mothers. So you need to be careful how you speak to the older women as well. Treat them like you would your mother. Speak to them the way that you would speak to your mother. And younger women, he says, treat as sisters with all purity. Treat the younger women the way that you would your own sister. Be pure in your relationships with those people. Um, children um, in smaller churches can learn to relate to others besides their peers, and young and old can benefit from each other's strengths. Uh, the family of God, it's a, it's a wonderful blessing. It's a blessing most often experienced in small churches where you do have a family 
type atmosphere. So that's a positive. And I've heard people who have come and visited with us and have mentioned that they appreciate the, the sense of family, the warmness and how they are greeted and how people actually notice when they walk in the door. As I say, I've had people tell me we've been to other churches that are bigger and they didn't even know we were visitors. Nobody talked to us. We just stood there awkward. Uh, so they appreciate the family type of atmosphere. That's an advantage. We should use that to our advantage as a smaller group. Here's some other things. There's certainly more intergenerational ties. Take a look at Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verses 28 through 30. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the Gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. I think the simple point that Jesus is making is that when you leave your father or mother in order to serve Jesus, and sometimes when people decide to serve Jesus, they do have to break ties with their family or with previous relationships, that you gain a whole new host of new relationships. That should be the way that it is in the church. Uh, we gain new friends, new family. We are able to go to new houses and develop those relationships which is a blessing we should be able to experience. What are some other benefits of a small church? Well, I think one of the other benefits of a small church is that there's more opportunities to serve. You've got more opportunities to serve. In Galatians chapter 5 and in verse 13, Galatians chapter 5 and in verse 13, it says, You brethren have been called to liberty. Don't use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. Through love, serve one another. Um, it's more likely in a smaller group that we are more needed. We're more needed. The roles to fulfill are not that much different between large and small churches, right? I mean, you in a big, whether we've got a thousand people here or a hundred people here, you've got one sermon to deliver. Um, you've got one song leader that's probably going to be used. You got the same probably amount of prayers and other things that are going on. Um, so, when you're in a smaller group, you have more opportunities to serve. That's an advantage. Especially for me, as a young man growing up, I was in a congregation similar to this size, and I went and preached for congregations that were much smaller than this, but it gave me the opportunity to serve. I was thankful for those small churches where I had the opportunity to preach out in the country uh, because they needed people to serve and they needed people to help. And if that hadn't been for those small groups, who, by the way, developed a whole bunch of preachers who are preaching all over the country now. The church that I was at in, in Stylesville, Indiana, where I started preaching when I was 16, there are several preachers who got their start right there at that little congregation with 20 people. Um, and because of the opportunities they had to preach there, they were able to develop as preachers and go on and preach other places as they grew older. But because of those opportunities uh, to serve, uh, it's given me the opportunity to preach the gospel now and to develop as a younger man. Uh, but there's roles. It's not just preaching, but serving in public worship, teaching Bible classes. Uh, whether you're a large or a small church, the number of teachers, preachers, and song leaders, it's about the same. And the ratio of roles to, to, to members is usually much greater in small churches. Um, we don't have a large pool of members to choose from. Um, therefore, there's a greater need in small churches. Now, some people, they may not like that. They may not like that they're called upon to serve more. But friends, if we have the heart of a servant, which is what Jesus wanted to develop in us, he wanted us to serve. He says, I came to seek and to save the lost. I came uh, not to be served, but to serve. And he encourages us to follow his example, his ethic, to be people who want to serve. If you're not willing to serve, you're not really interested in being like Jesus. Jesus wants us to be willing to serve. And so we should be thankful, in some sense, that we have opportunities to serve. And hopefully uh, we are using those who want to fill that need. Uh, larger churches often require a large rotation in its use of members, and so the opportunities to preach, the opportunities to teach classes, to serve in the public worship, they might be rare. Um, there are a lot of folks, they may have the opportunity to be used only once in a long while, but smaller churches use those who are willing to serve much more frequently. 
Sometimes it's out of necessity, um, but also it can be by design. So smaller churches are often the training ground for leaders for large churches. Um, they develop their skills in smaller churches. That's a positive thing. Um, it's more likely also, and I might add this, it's more likely that when you're a member of a smaller church that you're actually missed. Now again, um, some people don't want to be missed. And, and they don't like to be held accountable when they're not here. Um, but we should see that as a positive. That's a benefit. And when we're not here, people notice, people miss you, people want you to be here with them, and that they're holding you accountable. Um, and it should be a good thing that we hold one another accountable. Galatians 6 and verse 1, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So fulfill the law of Christ. Um, especially uh, is our absence felt when we're needed to fulfill a certain role. Uh, for example, if you're a Bible class teacher and you're not here, you're missed. Um, in larger churches, some people can be absent for weeks and nobody ever notices. And if you're the type of person who needs encouragement, that's important. Uh, you need to be missed. You need people to notice. You need people to catch it quickly, to take notice when we begin to show signs of weakness. Um, so there's some benefits there. Um, I would also mention that when we are using other people in the service and in the worship service, that there needs to be a good tolerance for their efforts. Um, sometimes we're going to use younger people. I've had people, when I'm gone, preach sermons. I listened most of those sermons. In fact, when I was on my way to Missouri the other day, I listened to a sermon by Randy Ritchie and Jeff and Eric from two years ago. The guys did a pretty good job. They, thank you for filling in for me two years ago. Um, but I finally got to listen to that sermon. Listen to a sermon by Travis. You know, every once in a while you listen to a sermon, you think, man, that was, that was kind of rough. But then I think back when I was 16, I think, man... Some of those sermons were pretty rough, too. And I'm so glad people had the patience to listen to me and to give me the opportunities, because that's where we learn. That's where we learn. First Timothy chapter 4, and verse 12 says, Let no one despise your youth. Be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Uh, we need to be trying our best, and we need to be also not despising the young people, but appreciating the fact that they're making efforts to pray, to maybe be involved in leading singing, and even eventually, hopefully, be involved in preaching and teaching. We need to be trying to develop that, because um, there's opportunities and there is a need for that as well. Uh, it's also very possible that when we're a part of a small church, we're more likely to grow. Um, we can work together. Um, we can train those who are willing to learn and serve. Uh, we can open our pulpit to those who um, are interested, perhaps, in preaching and teaching, and we can give them opportunities to preach from that pulpit. We can hopefully open our Bible classes and encourage our older women to mentor our younger women as teachers and get them involved in the teaching program. Some positive things that can happen as a smaller church that can lead to the growth of our younger people, and we should be trying to develop those types of relationships. Well, those are some of the benefits, but I want to just mention also the obligations of a small church. The obligations of a small church. One is that we need to nurture that sense of family. You can still be a small church and not have much of a sense of family. We need to nurture that sense of family. Congregationally, we need to do it by providing opportunities for spiritual fellowship. That's why we have Bible classes. Um, so that we can learn together and study the Word of God together. And we should be involved in those classes, preparing for those. That's why we need to have gospel meetings um, or seminars, like we called it in, um, in March. Opportunities for people to come together and grow in their spiritual fellowship. There needs to perhaps be visitation programs. The church where I preached in Missouri a couple of weeks ago was a church of about 60 people. 
uh, but they had a, a visitation program. They had um, basically a chart that was set up, and there were a couple of people who got together every week, and they wrote cards to people who hadn't been there. They spent maybe an hour together and went and visited people to encourage them who hadn't been there, or people who were down and discouraged. They made the time and the effort uh, to try to encourage those, those lost sheep. Uh, we need to make time to minister to the sick. So congregationally, we need to nurture the sense of family that we care. And we need to care. Um, and then we need to nurture that individually by providing opportunities for hospitality. Invite other people to your home. When's the last time you had somebody into your home from the church? Ask yourself that. Um, not just to come do something. You know, maybe you got a job or some work to do, but they actually just had them into your home just, just to talk and to share and to enjoy one another's company. Or maybe you don't want to have them to your home. When's the last time you had somebody over for dinner or got something to eat with somebody? Not, not family. Family doesn't count. I don't count family. We're talking about people outside of family. When's the last time you did that? To try to nurture that sense of family. We need to spend time together. Get together for social occasions. In Acts chapter 2, the early church, they were coming together at the temple, but they were also going to one another's houses and breaking bread from house to house and join one another's company. Can't help but think that maybe one of the reasons that church was growing and was developing was because, first of all, they kept their, their minds in the Word but they're also encouraging and supporting and getting to know one another as a family. And churches need to get to know each other um, in those ways. Get together. Uh, as we seek to nurture our sense of family, we've got to be careful not to limit our efforts to those in our physical families. And that can be a temptation of a smaller church as well. Sometimes we've got a lot of family members and people who are interconnected and we all get together and talk with each other and we, we kind of forget about everybody else. We need to make sure... Others are being included in nurturing that sense of spiritual family in the church. Those are the obligations. We can nurture a sense of family. We can provide opportunities for growth. Uh, looking for young men and women who are willing to teach. But here's another obligation is we need to watch for stagnation. It's a tempting thing to want to remain small to say, I'm really happy with these people who are here, and we're kind of at peace, and we all kind of like each other, so let's just kind of, just kind of keep things the way they are. Because there's advantages to having a smaller congregation. You know, it just feels warm, it's friendly. You kind of have this, this cliquish, if you will, attitude towards our church as a whole, where outsiders don't feel very welcome to our small little group. And that's certainly not what Jesus expected for the church. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 and 32, what you're going to read is the Lord expected the church to grow. We need to be making efforts for the church to grow. In Matthew 13, verse 31, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. A man took that mustard seed and sowed it in his field, and indeed it was the least of all the seeds, but when it's grown, it's greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Here, this small little seed, he says, it grew. That's what the kingdom is supposed to be like. We're supposed to be growing and making efforts to grow. John chapter 15, notice verses 1 and 2. John chapter 15, 1 and 2. Jesus says, I am the true vine, my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. It doesn't sound like Jesus is very happy with the lack of growth. He wants us to be bearing fruit. And every branch that bears fruit, he prones that it may bear more fruit. Here's two different passages emphasizing the importance of growth and seeking to grow. Seeking to grow as individuals, seeking to grow as a congregation, looking for opportunities to do so. It might be a small group, but don't content yourself with that. It's not right. It's sinful. We need to be interested in evangelism here, personal evangelism, reaching out to our friends, encouraging people to be a part of the Lord's kingdom and the Lord's church, talking to people, being interested 
in the church's growth. And it can grow. If God could do amazing things with 300 men and defeat an army of over 135,000 with the men of Gideon as they go against the Midianites, I think God can do great things in His plan for the church if we'll just follow it, if we'll implement it. People who are interested in growth. I appreciate people like Rick. Rick's been coming in here. A lot of people don't know about it, but I'm going to brag on him. But he's been coming in here on Wednesdays, and he comes in here with his video camera ready, and we've been trying to record these five-minute videos. He takes the time to put videos on YouTube. Why? Because I think Rick's interested in growth. I think Rick's interested in doing what he can. He knows how to use a video camera. He knows how to use a computer. He knows that people today, especially younger people, are using the Internet. And so if we're interested in growth, we need to find ways to get through to people in those ways. How many of you pick, how long does it take you when you wake up in the morning to grab hold of your phone? Really? How long? Does it take anybody longer than an hour? Most of you, I'd say, <laughs> I'd say that most people who are phone addicts, which is most of you, you pick up your phone within seconds of waking up. Am I right? Am I right, Haley? Yes, thank you. We, you guys pick up your phone and what do you do? You scroll through it. You look at social media. What do you need to do if you want to reach out to people today? Okay? You can pick up a track. Our tracks are great that are back there, but let me tell you what people are using. People are using their phones and their computers and they're using the internet. And if you want to grow, then that's where it's at, y'all. You, you need to start emphasizing, trying to get the word out and the message out through those means a little bit better. Sharing the gospel that way. You need to be talking to people. Talking to people in an age where people don't talk to one another anymore. So if you want the church to grow, then you've got to start talking to your friends about the church talking about what you learn, talking about what you're studying in Bible study, talking about the gospel, talking about their, the problems that they're having in their lives and sharing God's word with them to try to help them through those problems and show them how God can help them through those things. You need to be talking up the word. If we're going to grow, we need to be people who are talking up the word, looking for opportunities with our network of friends to grow the church. Don't be content with being stagnant. Don't be content with that. If you're content with being stagnant, you might like this little church right now and this little family group, but I'll tell you what, there's been too many churches that have been content with being stagnant and they are slowly and consistently shutting their doors. Not just, we're talking about churches of Christ, we're talking about denominations all over the place. That's exactly what's happening all across the country. The younger generation is not as involved in the church. The older generation is dying out. And the people who are somewhere in the middle aren't active enough in evangelism and aren't getting the word out. And we need to be talking about it more. Don't be content with stagnation. There are advantages to different sizes in congregations. I'm not saying that the small church, that's the way to go. Look, there's advantages to being a bigger church too. You've got more money to, sh to share with evangelists throughout the world. You've got more resources. You've got more people working. More people you've got working than hopefully the more you can do. So we need to be striving to grow and to increase. But my point's not been to suggest that one size is superior to another. The purpose has been to ensure that we don't let smallness become a hindrance. And that we don't become content with it. As a small congregation, we need to focus on our strengths which should lead to growth. And if we don't, we're likely going to stagnate, if not die altogether. So we need to be interested in developing those strengths and developing as a congregation. It's more likely we're going to be more healthy when we're focusing on those strengths and we're working on our weaknesses. Take a look at Ephesians chapter 5 with me. Ephesians chapter 5. As we close out. <coughs> Ultimately, what I want you to see from this passage is you don't need to be a part of the church because of its smallness or because of its largeness. Both of those things are dumb reasons to be members of churches. 
if that's the only reason. You need to be a part of the Lord's church because that's where the saved are. Jesus has chosen His church as the locale for those who are saved. In the Old Testament, He shows the ark as the locale for those who were saved from the flood. In the Old Testament, He chose those who had brushed blood upon their doorposts as being the locale for those who were going to be saved um, when the angel of death passed over the people of Israel and Egypt. And as we take a look at the New Testament, God has chosen the church as being the locale of those who are saved from their sins. Ephesians 5 verse 23 says, The husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church and He is the Savior of the body. Jesus is the Savior of the body. Why do you need to be a part of His church? Because that's where the saved are. You can't pretend to be saved and not be a part of His church. It says, Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be their own husbands in everything. If you are a member of the church, what does it mean? You have submitted yourself to Jesus Christ. He is your head. He is the head of the church, the head of the body. Husbands, he says, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. If you're someone who believes in Jesus Christ and believes in his sacrifice, his blood sacrifice for your sins, then you're someone who needs to be a part of the church because Christ died and sacrificed himself for the church. Verse 25 says, Why? That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word through the blood of Jesus Christ. We have been sanctified and we have been cleansed. And that happens when we are baptized, washed of water, and when we apply the Word to ourselves. Those who are in the church are those who have been baptized in Jesus Christ and those who have applied the Word to their own lives. That He might present her, that's the church, to Himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. If you're a part of the church, you're someone who is holy. You're set apart. You've chosen to rid yourself of the blemish and the sin that was once existing in your life. You want to get that out of your life so that you can be a faithful bride to Jesus Christ. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. How does the Lord nourish and cherish the church? Well, he does it through your family members who are brothers and sisters in Christ who are your teachers, who should be your mentors, who should be those who are admonishing and encouraging you. The Lord cares and nourishes and cherishes the church. How does the Lord do that? The Lord does that through His Word, which each of us apply to our lives, and we help one another grow through it. We are members of His body, of His flesh, and of His bones, verse 30 says. We are a part of a family unit, of a body. It says, For this reason a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. He says, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. When we become a part of the church, when we become a part of Jesus Christ, we are leaving our past life and being a part of a new family unit when you're part of the church. Nevertheless, he goes on to talk more about the family relationships. Let each of one, one of you in particular love his own wife as himself. Let the wife see that she respects her husband. The ultimate lesson that Paul's trying to get across in Ephesians 5, he's really using husbands and wives as an illustration, but the ultimate lesson is you know better how to be a husband and wife when you understand the importance of Christ's relationship to his church. Are you a member of that church? Friends, we need you to be a member of the Lord's church and the Lord needs you. Are you concerned with what's going on in our world today? Are you concerned with the sin, with the violence, with the, the hatred of God that exists in our world today? I'm going to tell you, then, if you are, if you are, then you need to be a part of the Lord's church. Because the Lord's church, is to try, their efforts and their goal is to try to dispel darkness with the light of Jesus Christ. We need people who are interested in that who aren't interested in being darkness, but who are interested in being light, who are interested in joining themselves to Jesus Christ. If you want that, we encourage you today, turn from your sins, follow the Word, be washed in water as you're baptized into Jesus Christ. Join yourself to Jesus Christ, and by doing so, you will be a part of His church. And as you are part of His church, you will also... Uh, want to be a part of a local congregation and work with that local congregation to share the light 
with the lost world. If you haven't made that decision yet, then why are you waiting? Be a part of the family of God. Be a part of the church. If you aren't, you aren't saved. And if you aren't saved, then the condition that you're in this morning is that you're lost. You're lost. If you're not a part of the church, you're lost today. And if your life was to end or the Lord was to return, you would have no hope beyond this life. God's Word can offer you no hope beyond this life if you aren't yet in Christ and thus in His church. And so we ask you to be a part of His church. It's where the saved are. It's where the servants are. And if you want to be a part of that church, then be a, make that decision this morning while we stand and while we sing.